Hi, everyone, and welcome to Remaking Tomorrow, a series of conversations about the future of teaching and learning. I'm Greg Baer, co-author of When You Wonder, You're Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. This is a podcast powered by Remake Learning, a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological change. On today's episode, I'm talking with Jun Lei Lee, the Saul Zan Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education and Co-Chair of the Human Development and Education Program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Before joining the faculty there, he was co-director of the Fred Rogers Institute at St. Vincent College. In both roles, Jun Lei's research and practice have focused on understanding and supporting the work of helpers. That is, the people who serve children and families on the front lines of education and social services. Jun Lei, welcome to Remaking Tomorrow. Greg, it's great to hear from you. And it's great to be with you, Jun Lei. I want to start with something I first heard when I watched a convocation address you gave at Harvard. You said something to the students that really stuck with me. If I could wish for one thing, I hope that you would allow yourself the grace of being enough. Can you say more about that? What does it mean to be enough? I think it came about during graduation season where a lot of our students, you know, with their Harvard degrees, <laughs> feel very anxious about going back into their communities and neighborhood and, and feeling unsure what is it that they can do in their communities and whether they have learned enough during their time here. And uh, it was also during a difficult time for the country. The day before the commencement was the mass shooting in the classrooms in Texas, where both children and teachers died. I think I was really thinking a lot about what does it mean to be enough, you know, when you are out there uh, wanting to help and support children and families in your community. And I think at the same time, I was also wondering about what is it that makes any of us feel not enough, not enough to be a parent, not enough to be a teacher, not enough to be someone in the community who wants to help. So anyhow, I think that's how this idea of wanting to articulate what it means to be enough, particularly for the helping professionals, I think came about. Jinlei, this is a great big idea, and it's an idea that stands in sharp contrast to the messages we often give ourselves, let alone others, that we always need to do more, that we always need to work harder even when we feel like we can't, that without that self-inflicted pressure, we're letting folks down or letting problems in the world go unchallenged. Can you say more what led you to this idea of being enough? Was it those moments that you described, the environment around you, the news of the day? What else was triggered in your brain that led you to this idea? Once I start to think about the question, kind of what is enough and how do we know it, I start to recognize that my colleagues and I have been thinking about that question all along. So my work, along with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dana Winters, who's the current executive director at the Fred Rogers Institute, and, and Dr. Tom Akiva, who's a faculty at University of Pittsburgh, we have been focused a lot on understanding the quality of human interactions in educational environments from early childhood to classrooms to out of school time. And Early on for me, when I was working in a variety of early childhood environments from low-income communities, childcare providers to orphanages overseas in China, my home country, I noticed that often if you read official research and other policy documentations about what quality is supposed to be, it seems overwhelming. But when we actually go into these places, when we actually watch the caregivers, the educators work with children, we find that what they do day in and day out that feels enough for the child and enough for themselves as professionals seem quite different uh, from the kind of things we outline in policy and research kind of documents. 
And often what people do day in and day out are simple, they are ordinary, but they're incredibly human. I think the idea for wanting to be able to see and articulate what is enough probably goes all the way back to our time observing and studying kind of caregivers on the ground, trying to understand the kind of simple and deep things that they do. Jinlei, as you're talking, I, I'm thinking about myself, right? I think about myself as a parent, wondering all the time, am I enough? Am I doing enough? I think about my professional roles. Am I doing enough? Am I serving the community in ways that I'm privileged to do? You're a lecturer at Harvard, where you teach all kinds of courses about learning and child development. And Harvard being Harvard, I'm guessing your students feel pressured almost all of the time. So what does the idea of being enough do for learners? How do learners change when they begin to see themselves as enough? I think whether it is graduate students or whether it is three and four year olds, if we, the teachers, which of course include parents and, and all the mentors and coaches outside school, if we can help them see how they approach learning, the way that they're trying to make their learning make sense in the real world that they live in, we can help them understand that the way they're going about doing it is enough versus right holding some artificial threshold above them that says unless you reach here you're not enough i think perhaps two very different ways of thinking in the educational world one is much more focused on the present on today i think all of us perhaps learn more confidently and more comfortably if we have a sense that the enoughness is in what we do day in and day out rather than striving for some artificial kind of threshold that someone have held up there, which sometimes, you know, to the struggling student or child may feel unattainable. Struggling. Junlei, I wonder if you'll comment, have you struggled with this personally? You who hold so many roles, you the teacher of so many helpers, how are you realizing enough? Yeah, that's a great question, Greg. You mentioned early on, you know, you were a parent too, and so am I. We both have two girls. <laughs> and I certainly think about that a lot as a parent. I don't know any parents who don't think about that. But I also think about that professionally as a teacher, as a presenter. And I always have this kind of unrealistic fantasy that whenever I teach, right, whether the classroom is 10 people or 100 people, I wanted to connect with every single person. I wanted, you know, whatever I teach to make sense to every single person. And over time, I try to remind myself as well as to remind my students who are going on to be teachers and leaders in their own arena, this idea that you know, when you teach a class, when you lead a workshop, even when we're doing a podcast, we don't know every single person who's listening or who's participating. And what we can trust is that if we honestly bring what we feel, what we understand, what we believe to this thing that we're doing, then we're bringing our 50% right to that experience. And whoever's participating and learning bring their 50%. And sometimes these two halves meet and something terrific happens. And other times it may not connect in the way that we hope that it would connect. But so long as we're honest, so long as we have tried our very best to imagine, to understand what our listeners may be looking for, I think that may be enough. It doesn't, I think, stop us right from always striving to do better. But I think there's a difference between striving to do better and believing that we can do enough versus striving to do better under the pressure of feeling that nothing we ever do is going to be enough. This is Greg Baer. I'm talking with Jun Lei Lee, a senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Jinlei, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Rogers, someone who incredibly, in the last days of his life, wondered if he was enough. Because your route to Cambridge, Massachusetts, led through Latrobe, Pennsylvania, 
where you used to lead what's now called the Fred Rogers Institute. We want to talk a little bit about Fred and how did Fred first enter your life? I came to Pittsburgh as a graduate student studying developmental psychology or child development. And uh, I remember on days when I didn't have early morning classes, I would just stay home uh, in Edgewood and I would turn PBS on. And that's when Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was still running in the morning. And I remember recognizing that Fred Rogers was teaching about child development, even in a television program that were targeting three to five year olds. But everything he was talking about meant a lot to me as a graduate student. But at the same time, I also realized that the kind of things that Fred Rogers was teaching, I wasn't learning in my research focused graduate studies. So I think I was trying to learn about children's development, both in my graduate school and uh, from PBS. And it was at the Fred Rogers Institute that, together with Dr. Dana Winters, you helped to develop a beautiful framework that you've called Simple Interactions. It's work that Ryan and I cite all the time. It's in our book, and we've seen it used in brilliant ways all across the country. Can you tell us what is Simple Interactions, and how did it come to be? Simple Interactions is, I think it's a couple of things. So one, it's just this fundamental understanding that in all of the educational and developmental environments that we have around us, whether it's school or out of school time, whether it's a museum or whether it's outdoors, that the most important thing are the human relationships that we build with one another in the course of learning and developing. And what are the most important parts of a human relationship? Well, it's those simple, ordinary, everyday interactions we have with each other, with parents, with friends, with teachers. So then the question's, okay, so what are simple, everyday interactions? What are these little building blocks of human relationships? I think with my colleague Dana and Tom, I mentioned earlier, I think over time we try to refine this very simple tool. It's just this single page of 12 little pictures that we call the Simple Interactions Tool. And it's simply a tool that's designed to remind people to look for these simple and ordinary moments all around themselves, especially when they are with children and youth. For listeners who are interested, we share all these resources completely kind of open source simpleinteractions.org. And Junlei, you and Dr. Winters and Dr. Akiva, you've studied simple interactions all over the world. When you think about that work, is there a place or maybe a moment that really stands out for you? Something that underscored for you just how powerful these simple interactions can be? I think each place touched us greatly. I think Dr. Winters uh, had studied the crossing guards in the city of Pittsburgh, as well as child life specialists in Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. I had spent time in orphanages overseas, and uh, we had spent time together in group homes for youth in Canada. And if I were to name one place, I think the first place that comes to my mind at the moment is this small village in China who became a foster care village for orphans, orphans with disabilities. There were about 200 children placed in the village when we visited for the first time. And what was so striking to us, and Greg, this goes back to what I was talking about enough. Every time we visited the village, the administrators would apologetically tell us that I'm sorry about the kind of quality of care here because our staff are just not professional enough because what they call staff are these farmers who are foster parents. But every year when we study there and when we observe what these staff do, when we record them on video and we bring these videos back to the United States and show experts you know, in the field, They thought this is absolutely remarkable work, right? So here are, you know, these farmers, most of whom are women, who didn't have formal training in child development or special education or physical therapy, but somehow just through their sense of community with each other and their love and affection for the children, they kind of just figured out all these different ways that they can help those particular 
children learn and grow in very specific ways, right? From being able to eat, to walk, to read, to sing, to dance. And it's really kind of the ultimate example of it takes a village, except this village has so little of what we, particularly in the United States, would take for granted as the kind of resources that would make things enough. They don't have what we would consider enough, but the children who develop there certainly have enough from the community. Junlai, you've taken a very special human-centered sensibility with you to Harvard, where you co-chair the Human Development and Education Program. So what are you working on these days? What interests you as an academic, and where do you hope your path leads next? The things that interest me at the moment all revolve around this core of relationships. So one of the courses that I love to teach here to students all across our graduate school who might be interested in teaching or public policy or learning design and technology is this course called Empowering Human Relationships Across Developmental contexts. And the idea is no matter what we do, whether you're a policymaker, you're a teacher, you're a school leader, or you're someone who designs apps and technology, that you can think about to what extent can the thing you do, can the thing you design or, or the policy you decide help to enrich and encourage the human relationships that we actually have with one another. So that's the course that I love to teach each year. The thing that I'd like to do professionally and uh, within the last few years with colleagues in the policy world, colleagues in, in the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as colleagues in the philanthropy and foundation world, is to articulate and develop this idea that is called early relational health. And what it means is that, you know, over the last few years of the pandemic, there's lots of discussion, of course, about our physical health and certainly about mental health, particularly for young people. But I think what is clear is that both physical health and mental health and behavioral health, all of these things are built on a foundation of relational health. This is something that our current Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy also kind of talks about and write about this idea that all of us, our well-being, not just the learning and achievement, but our fundamental well-being is built on a bedrock of relationship of what we might call relational health. So what does it mean right, to build relational health around children, around families, around the professionals who serve them? And who are the relational health professionals? Instead of thinking of us merely as, oh, here's a child care provider, here's an after-school provider, and here's a teacher, what if all of us fundamentally are relational health professionals? That part of what we do is to build this foundational of relational health that can serve as a foundation for learning and development and well-being, but also serve as a protective buffer against the kind of stressors that come at us unscheduled. Junlei, as we close our conversation today, are you ready to play a bit of a lightning round of questions? <laughs> I'll do my best, Greg. Okay, first things that come to mind. The first time you really felt you were enough. I was talking about the village earlier, and in the past, I think every year I used to go there, I thought that I have to design and bring the most useful workshop. And uh, one year I was there, and there was no workshop because of a variety of reasons, and I was disappointed in not being able to contribute. But the parents, the foster parents in the village were just so happy that we had a chance to visit and whether or not there was a workshop wasn't even important. The first person who was enough for you? I think it had to be my mother, who during the kind of 1970s turmoil in China, she raised me by herself for most of my early childhood, and, and she always felt badly that she didn't have all the resources and means to you know be with me all the time because she worked full time. But I think as a child, you just, you knew your parent was enough and everything she did was enough. The helper who lingers in your mind, the person you think of when you hear the word helper. I think I have to say my colleague, 
uh, whom you know very well, Dr. Dana Winters. I think in all the years I worked with her, I mean, she was this incredible colleague for me to work with. But every time I see her work with helping professionals in the field, you know, whether they are parole officers or whether they're early childhood providers and teachers, I think she was just so consistently offering that space, right, for all these helping professionals to feel that their work is worthwhile. That's a wonderful citation. Dr. Dana Winters is the executive director of the Fred Rogers Institute. And listeners, you can catch her on a previous podcast episode of Remaking Tomorrow. Junlei, how can people find out more about the work that you're doing? Well, I would encourage people to follow us on simpleinteractions.org. We have uh, you know, a pretty infrequent newsletter, but a lot of our talks and tools and ideas are just up there on the site, open to everyone. And, and most importantly, I'd love for people to just play with our tools and ideas in their own work, in their own life, and send us a note about it. We love to hear these stories, and we love to hear kind of these very simple, incredibly human stories that happen all around us. And before you go, we have just one more question for you. What's one thing that parents and educators can do today to make tomorrow a more promising place for every learner. Parents and teachers can just be aware when they feel the pressure of never enough. And that instead of feeling that in order, you know, to be the kind of parent or teacher we want to be, we just need to go out and find and provide all the best resources and opportunities for our kids. I think if parents and teachers can instead recognize that they themselves are their children, their students' most important resource, and that when they spend the time that they are able to get to know the child or students in their care, they can truly be enough. Thanks again to Junlei Li, the Saul Zan Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education and co-chair of the Human Development and Education Program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Remaking Tomorrow is powered by Remake Learning. Learn more at remakelearning.org.